Looks like everyone is ready. We are here in the matter of State versus Tucker. Um, and I believe we will have Ms. Donalds today arguing on behalf of um, the defense. You may begin. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. Good morning, happy Constitution Day. My name is Jess Donalds and I represent Taiwan Tucker. Mr. Tucker raised four issues in his application for further review, and in honor of Constitution Day, I'd like to start by focusing on the two that do embrace constitutional issues. The first of those being the exclusion of Mr. Tucker's settlement documents as a discovery sanction uh, during the course of the trial. Uh, there, you say two constitutional issues. The state does not agree that those are constitutional issues, correct? Uh, correct. For uh, abuse of discretion review instead? Yes, Your Honor. The Court of Appeals did find that the constitutional argument regarding the settlement documents was not properly preserved because it was not raised and decided below. However, if you look at the trial transcript, volume 2, page 110, uh, Mr. Macro, uh, Mr. Tucker's trial attorney, did point out that this was a part of Mr. Tucker's due process right to present a defense. Uh, he did not elaborate very much on that argument, but he did raise it as an issue. And on page 115 of Trial Transcript Volume 2, the court did acknowledge the argument that this did pertain to the right to present a defense. There was not a fulsome discussion of the right below, and I do think that um, the discovery sanction portion of the argument was much more fully discover, um, discussed and also does provide an adequate basis for reviewing this as a discovery sanction rather than a due process violation. However, I do think the due process right to put a defense is relevant to resolving the discovery violation. The important case to look at for the discovery violation in a criminal context is State v. Veal, 564 Northwest 2nd, 797 in Iowa, 1997. And I think Veal is really illustrative here of how this could have been resolved because it perfectly encapsulates what would have happened if the situation were reversed, if the state had violated the discovery rules rather than Mr. Tucker, who frankly the court was a little bit frustrated with because of his frequent outbursts during trial. In State v. Veal, a first degree murder case, the state's key witness, a Ms. Parsons, testified that Veal confessed murder to her and testified during trial details of that murder um, that were very incriminating and harmful to Ms. Veal. After Ms. Parsons testified, the state disclosed that a few weeks before trial, Ms. Parsons, the state had discovered that Ms. Parsons lied about her age, her identity, and the timing of certain events. Now, Ms. Veal challenged that late disclosure on two grounds. The constitutional ground, Brady v. Maryland, was of course resolved by the fact that the evidence was disclosed in time for Ms. Veal to use it. And also as a discovery sanction, because... Distinction, it was challenged at that level, um, Veal, on the constitutional aspect as well, correct? Discovery sanction, which is the test that we're focusing on for Mr. Tucker. Um, as a discovery sanction, the court considered the circumstances surrounding the violation, the prejudice to Ms. Veal, the feasibility of curing the prejudice, and other relevant considerations. Now, the court was not happy with the state's conduct in delaying this very uh, compelling testimony for the defense after the witness had already testified. The court um, discouraged such conduct and said that it was, in no uncertain terms, not okay. But the court also noticed by giving a one-day continuance and allowing Ms. Veal to take depositions of Ms. Parson to investigate it and to take full use of that testimony, that the prejudice was cured. And this is important because the core function of a jury trial is to find the truth and serve justice. Excluding the testimony would not be fair to the state because it was important testimony for their case. And the defendant had an opportunity to cure their prejudice by taking that extra time to get it right, by doing that one-day continuance and having the opportunity. In that case in particular, um, maybe it was cured, but in this case, can it really be cured? I think another distinction between Veal and this case, um, that case, the evidence didn't come in, nor did 
was the defendant or the, the state allowed to talk about it at all, correct? State. Should... Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So in this case, the, the judge's part of his ruling was it's almost like a little bit duplicative. There's already been testimony about it. It is in part of the video um, talking about that. We're going to let him talk about it. And the state agreed. And I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to rub your nose in it in closing that you didn't have evidence. Um, and, and in conjunction with violation of the mo motion in limine. My concern is. How do you cure that if that ends up being, I think it was argued by the state, hey, that's a big part of our case. That's a big part of our preparation. And we already had one whole day in trial. This isn't a pretrial ruling. This was during trial. So isn't that quite a difference with Veal? The Veal violation also happened during trial. The uh, new evidence was disclosed to the defense after Ms. Parsons testified. Uh, I do agree that the state said that this was a linchpin of their case and that they felt that it was too late to investigate it. But it was also too late for Ms. Veal. They had to pause the trial and they had to do those extra depositions. And that's something that could have been done here and could have changed the states um, and could have um, been accomplished. Now, the settlement documents themselves, the state did not have those. But the fact that Mr. Tucker claimed that these were proceeds from a settlement was something that was known. About it. You know, if. Uh, again, it, we're looking at this, it's very easy for us to Monday morning quarterback. We have the luxury of no longer having to be trial lawyers. But if I'd been the defense lawyer, and I know I'm in a little bit of hot water, and I'm trying to get this document in that wasn't timely disclosed, you know, what about just uh, getting in touch with the lawyers, I guess it was, they were also called Tucker, and saying, uh, and getting them available and say, I'll, I'll make them available by telephone to, this, to the prosecutor so they can talk and verify that this stuff is on the up and up. Um, I mean, did the lawyer do anything like that? I don't have the exact page citations for you, but it's somewhere trial transcript volume two in the 110 to 115 range. Mr. Macro said that he was just handed these documents. Now, he didn't implicitly trust Mr. Tucker's statement. He actually went and verified him himself by having his law firm contact the Tucker law firm and speak with the secretary to verify the documents. He told, explained to the court this process took him five seconds and that he believed the secretary could be produced in order to help the state satisfy their evidentiary grounds as well. So if you look at the factors laid out in Veal, the circumstances surrounding the violation, of course those weigh against Mr. Tucker. Back to the foundation to admit the letter. That was Mr. Macro's statements. I don't know that Mr. Macro used the specific words offer of proof, but he did explain to the court. Who could verify that these were in fact business records or? Your Honor, from the time that the records were disclosed to the state to the time that the record was made, this all happened about simultaneously in the transcript. On what basis would they be admissible? The letter, what, on what basis would the letter be admissible? Isn't it hearsay? Potentially, Your Honor. Uh, however, it's my, uh, my view that the proper foundation could be made to establish that this was a business record. This was a letter sent by a law firm on law firm letterhead. Attached to it were various invoices and a copy of a check. These are the routine types of documents that a law firm will send to their client when they settle a civil suit. This mentioned? According to whom? What witness in this record said all the things you just said? Mr. Macro made some professional statements to that effect. There was no witness called. He did offer to, again, he did explain to the court that, that he had spoken to the secretary and that she could possibly be made available to lay this foundation. The court ruled on that matter without granting a continuance to see whether that foundation could be laid. And why you wouldn't continue. Let's, let's assume for um, discussion that we're going to review this on um, abuse of discretion. What is your argument on that? So that turns to the, circum the factors laid out in Veal, the circumstances surrounding the violation, the prejudice, feasibility of curing prejudice, and other relevant considerations. Obviously, the circumstances surrounding the violation do weigh against Mr. Tucker. This should have been disclosed earlier. However, I think that is mitigated by the fact that the, the state did know that there was a settlement that uh, Mr. Tucker claimed to explain the cash in this case. Uh, from the time that they arrested him, he began explaining this to law enforcement. Um, I also I about this. If I understand this right, there were two trials. Is that right? 
trial started. Uh, it was interrupted because during jury selection because there was the the initial jury panel was more than one standard deviation away um, from having enough African Americans in it to be representative of the community. Your client did not disclose the letter at the time of the first trial. Is that correct? And your client did not disclose the letter at the start of the second trial. Is that correct? The letter is disclosed on the second day of the second trial. Yes, Your Honor. I'm a district court judge, and there are multiple orders in the file directing the defendant to disclose a document, a request from the state to disclose a document. We start a trial. It's not disclosed. We come back. What's the time difference? Weeks, months between the two trials? In the Veal trial, the state was able to make this to cure their prejudice in one day, Your Honor. If what's the difference in what's the length of time between the first trial and the second trial in this case? I believe the first trial would have been in June, and the second trial. Um, I, I guess my question is: Is how could we say the district court abused its discretion under these circumstances? And wouldn't we be saying that really in every case the district court's required to just continue trial and allow the state to cure the prejudice caused by the defendant's failure to disclose? And that's kind of what you're arguing, right? Yes, Your Honor, and I certainly understand your point, but what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If the state can withhold discovery from the defendant until after the witness has testified and it's not an abuse of discretion to allow the state to cure it, why can't the defendant cure his error? And looking at the four factors outlined in Veal, in this case, I think you're assuming Veal is spot on, and, I, and I'm not so sure Veal is spot on. But in this case, under these facts, um, I like Justice um, McDonald's question. Aren't you saying that the, the, um, the, the salve that you're asking us to apply <clears throat> is, hey, courts, whenever you're presented with a situation, the trial shall be continued. Is that the right thing when you've got juries called? You've spent one whole day picking a jury, one whole day hearing evidence, you're on the third day of trial, technically, of the second trial. Is that judicial economy and efficiency? Well, it's a multifactorial test. I'm not saying that every defendant who fails to disclose evidence to the state um, should get a continuance to cure their error. Um, absolutely not. I understand that you're saying the Veal case is distinguishable because there were two issues, the constitutional issue and the discovery sanction issue. But the four-part test that I'm discussing does come directly from the discovery sanction uh, part of the review. The Brady challenge was rejected in Veal because the evidence was disclosed in time for the defense to make use of it. If the district court had said it's the second day of trial and because of that, I just don't, if he had a policy or she had a policy of saying I'm not going to allow continuances, would that be a, an abuse of discretion? A policy would absolutely be an abuse of discretion because a policy is a failure to exercise discretion. So in this case, was that, one of, was that a key factor for the district court or did the district court consider the other factors as well? The district court considered other factors. However, I believe the district court erred in its consideration of the circumstances surrounding the violation, the prejudice to the state, and the feasibility of curing that prejudice. Um, we've been discussing the circumstances surrounding the violation. It is in the record that Mr. Tucker provided it to his first attorney, a Mr. Taylor. And it, the, for whatever reason, the settlement documents did not make the transition from law firm to law firm as Mr. Tuckler cycled through various trial counsels. To, to the defense, he's already able to say that he, had, he this $600 in cash the state is arguing shows he's a drug dealer. Uh, he has an explanation for it. It's this settlement would have been uh, more powerful of defense to show the, the documentation to prove that? I think that would have been incredibly powerful evidence for his case. Uh, law enforcement officers in this case testified that large amounts of cash were a red flag for them, that they essentially that they don't think people carry cash for good reasons and that it's a sign of drug dealing. Uh, being able to document where that cash comes from shifts it from being unexplained cash to explained cash. What difference does that make? Well, it comes down to... Possession, right? I mean, that's not disputed. Possession versus possession with intent to distribute was a critical distinction for this client in his trial. 
penalty part of this, the possession charge is enhanced because of his prior convictions, correct? That's accurate. So he ends up with a D felony under either circumstance. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. However, this was still a very important issue for Mr. Tucker, as it's his right in his defense to choose what he admits to, what he does not. I want to also get to that issue of the exclusion. Of the, you're talking about two different um, issues, and we've only talked about one. The other one that you're narrowing it down to is the exclusion of the full DVD. I know you'll get a chance to come back, but can you briefly address your position on that? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the exclusion of the full DVD, I do not believe was actually raised as a constitutional issue. Uh, my uh, second constitutional issue was going to be the uh, jury makeup. However, if you'd like me to briefly address the exclusion of the full DVD, I'm prepared to do so. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, counsel. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here, especially on Constitution Day. Uh, just to answer your factual question, Justice McDonald, uh, the continuance from the jury panel issue was June 3rd, uh, and then trial reconvened on August uh, 9th, sorry, 18th. So there was more than a month and a couple weeks in between, plenty of time to make a disclosure. The, uh, dis the documents, the letter, was subject to the reciprocal discovery order, a continuing duty to disclose and produce, uh, not produce before the first trial. This is about as egregious as a violation of a reciprocal discovery order gets, and the defendant was involved in discovery. Was, there were depositions taken of the state's witnesses. Um, now, I, I... What was the prejudice here, though? I'm, I'm sort of struggling with that issue because the... The defendant says the state was really just worried about whether this was an actual kind of valid letter, and it was from a law firm. Couldn't the state have simply called the law firm and said, hey, is this a settlement letter that you sent out on X date? And that would have resolved it? So that, that would have helped establish. Now, I'm, I'm not certain whether it would have been an e as easy as that. There could have been uh, attorney-client privilege issues et cetera. Um, but beyond that, there's the reason why the amount under the defense theory, the reason why the amount was relevant is because he says he purchased a convertible with that money and then had 650 in cash left over and that's what's in the center console. Well, once he puts the exact amount in there with documentary evidence, now the state needs to investigate the purchase price of the convertible, if it can find that evidence. Because uh, if the purchase price of the car is more, then it would have to be $3,000 or so, suddenly the cash isn't explained by that settlement letter, even though it purports to explain it. Now, I, I also think that this is all kind of a red herring, because... Well, I mean, <laughs> if I'm the prosecutor, I would just as soon not investigate the car, because if there's no evidence of the purchase of the car, surely you probably can't argue that in closing argument, but surely the jury is going to go figure that out and say, well, he had this story about purchasing the car and the settlement, but he only presented half of the evidence. He only presented the settlement, right? That's part of the reason why any error in this is, is very, would be harmless is because these documents on their own, A, as you pointed out, Justice McDonald, would not be admissible without foundation witnesses who are not in this record. Uh, they, would, they would just be hearsay. B, they would only present half of this not quite a defense that we're still missing the, the price of the convertible that he says he purchased, and also the state would want to investigate that and would probably need more than an afternoon to do that. Um, and third, uh, you know, the fact that somebody has a source of income is not an explanation for why they are carrying a large amount of the cash uh, at the same time as drugs, driving away from what definitely appears to be a drug transaction, and they speed off after they make eye contact with approaching police. Sort of a weight issue? I mean, what is the problem with, with putting this, this letter in for the state as a matter of evidence? I mean, the state can make that argument, but... Right. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be relevant and, and admissible if foundational requirements were complied with and if it were disclosed. What, I'm pointing that out to make a harmless error argument, to say that 
their argument. Um, you say in your brief that um, Mr. Tucker was not credible given his testimony about the marijuana. But, yeah, he said, I didn't have marijuana. They found mar marijuana. He was very clearly his credibility was attacked. So doesn't this then make that that evidence, that documentary, documentary evidence, even that much more important when the only other evidence of the settlement was his own testimony, but he's already not a credible witness. So it seems like that makes that this documentary evidence that much more important. I, I can see what you're saying. The, uh, one of the problems with that is that his credibility problems uh, create whenever there's a gap in the documentary evidence, right, so the absence of the purchase price of the, of the car or any proof, in fact, that the car was purchased earlier that day, um, his credibility operates on that to make the partial defense fail to close the gap. And I, so I, I can see what you're saying, that documentary evidence would help establish that he's telling the truth in his testimony. Unfortunately, one of the reasons why this discovery sanction is appropriate is because the state... Uh, the late disclosure meant the state didn't have the opportunity to investigate the evidence to, to uh, you know, to confirm whether or not it was actually supporting his claim and showing that he was telling the truth. Whether that was through it all that we know from the record that the evidence got in through his own testimony, he splattered it all over the evidence and was um, told to knock it off, quit talking about it. So he, he said it. Should that go into our consideration at all, almost as if an offer of proof in front of the jury, and yet he was still convicted? Is there any room for us to consider his behavior in just trouncing all over those motions in limine? I think we do consider that in assessing harmless error. I would say that, now the, the court didn't order him not to testify about it. The court said he could testify about it. Um, directly said, uh, about the documents, he, he violated the motion in limine by saying the judge won't let this in. There are documents out there. Absolutely. And I think that that is, now the, the jury was instructed to disregard those statements and I, I very firmly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very attached to our presumption that juries follow instructions to strike things that are not, that the court says to strike and not consider. Um, the, but I think that he, repeatedly returned to the idea that that settlement was paid. And he mentioned it in the video, too. So I, I think that, Justice Oxley, I think you're right that there would be some effect, maybe, of showing that, of the documentary evidence showing that there was a settlement. But it wouldn't help him in terms of his credibility on all of the other parts that, all the other facts that would need to be true for that to matter. Um, and I also want to go back to having a stream of income, right? I've got a stream of income. Uh, but if I have a, a wad of cash together with my drugs, the fact that I get a steady paycheck doesn't help defeat the inference drawn from that cash. Well, but we don't have proof from the, in those documents there wasn't any proof that he cashed it rather than depositing it or... Support. Without those documents, all we have is his testimony that there was a settlement, and then he's not allowed to say, as you say, the jury can't consider when he says, but there's documents to support what I'm saying. So now he's a completely not credible defendant, and the jury just doesn't believe anything that there was, that he's even making up that there was a settlement at all. So I think that the problem with his so he, he's almost reaping a windfall in that situation from the fact that the rest of his testimony is, is not even approaching credible. Um, I also want to point out that when their claim is that he, part of his prejudice. I'm sorry, how is that a windfall? When we're, we're looking for the truth. He says there's a settlement, um, and, he has, and he can't back that up, except he's got this piece of paper. He could have verified, um, he could have authenticated the check because it was made out to him, and he received the check. Um, it just seems like the that the state was making a lot more of this and, it, and it, it could have been handled a lot quicker than what the state seemed to think it would. So I, I, and I, I take your point that, you know, looking back at this transcript, it's, we, can, we can identify things that alternative routes to handling this that may not have uh, occurred to the parties in the moment, especially a late disclosure. That's one of the problems with a late disclosure is it puts everybody on the spot. Um, and the uh, I, I do think that there are still foundational problems with this. There's no foundational witness, and it would have to come in from him. Uh, you know, there's there's no way. I think the check would still present a, a problem, uh, a hearsay problem, and a 
Uh, but even going past that, you know, we talk about discretion vested in the trial court to manage discovery and, and uh, decide on discovery sanctions and how to deal with these problems. The, the concept of discretion means that there's more than one permissible answer and discretion to choose between them. And in this case, we've got a, a trial continued multiple times and uh, an extremely late disclosure after, after the presentation of evidence. Uh, this court in Christensen said that, uh, you know, faced a similar situation with late disclosure of an alibi witness and said, it's, it's not an abuse of discretion for the court not to grant a continuance um, because once the presentation of evidence starts, it grows stale in the jury's minds and there's more danger of biases and, and extraneous influences on the jury the longer that you're out, or the longer that it takes between start. He was found with one ounce of marijuana and $650 in cash and someone who was driving away who was believed to have purchased drugs from him. Is that... Was there, was there anything else? Because it's an alternative inference that uh, if you don't believe that, then what you would believe instead is that he purchased those drugs, uh, which is still a mid-level dealer quantity, uh, and that he the but he doesn't have any indicia of use with them. Like so, the inference is that he's taking them to a place where he will repackage them and sell them. Um, so I'm just pointing out that you don't need. You don't need to conclude that he sold rather than bought in order to conclude that he possessed with intent to deliver. Counsel, if we reverse this discretionary ruling, are we going to undermine the rules of criminal procedure on disclosure deadlines? I think so. I think that uh, one, you know, it, it, you could look at this as a tactic. And I think that there's a potential for abuse there. I would agree with that. And I think that... In effect, we'd be rewarding sandbagging. Especially, I think this case illustrates the use of tactics to, to try to, uh, or to try to introduce uh, complicating factors into the proceedings that, that uh, the defendant was trying to obstruct and stonewall. Um, I think that this might be. Did the court find that at all? I mean, did the district court make any comment on that about this being an effort at sandbagging or stonewalling? Yeah, it should be clear, the district court didn't make that finding. The district court did say that this case has been pending for a while, and this uh, also in the same transcript, there are findings uh, about contempt, about um, or uh, about conduct during proceedings, and it seemed very clear that the, the defendant was uh, not fully cooperating with the proceedings. So I, I, you know, I'm just saying that as an illustrative fact. The part rely primarily on the fact that trial had already started? Uh, it was an important factor. Also important was the fact that the disclosure happened after uh, many of the state's witnesses had testified. I, I think all the state's witnesses at that point. And uh, the fact that it was, uh, had been continued multiple times about the importance of the case and the potential for prejudice. Um, the loss of the state's ability to investigate and tailor its advocacy to uh, the evidence that it had a right to expect on the topic of the exclusion of the full DVD? Yes. So the DVD, now the only thing that he's saying should have been admitted but wasn't was his statement that he was shot by a, a different officer on a different occasion. He, I don't, didn't read the brief to be challenging the ruling that he couldn't testify as to those same facts, um, just the exclusion of the DVD. And I view this I could see a situation where it would be potentially relevant as a way to explain actions. The problem is that this case isn't it. That explanation, that fact is, first of all, it's hearsay as presented in the video, but the fact itself is not relevant and it's more prejudicial than probative under 403 because it's not, it doesn't make any fact more or less likely to be true, any fact of consequence in did he possess marijuana knowing what it was and with the intent to deliver? Did Judge Kelly look at the full video for purposes of the bench trial on the interference? That's right. Yes, you can see that. That. Yes. Or potentially relevant. For the possession with intent charge? That's right. Um, now, it, the defense brief s repeatedly says that the state used his, uh, Mr. Tucker's reaction on the video to argue that he intended to distribute marijuana. There's never a citation for that. 
that's not something that the state said or argued. The state argued that his reaction shows that he knows it's marijuana. And I think that that's extremely well supported by the video. The pattern in no reaction to just the initial confrontation or encounter with the officers, when the search gets to the groin area, suddenly there's that, that reaction. And then when the marijuana is found, everything is cordial again. That in the video, his statement about being shot occurs very early on, as soon as he gets out of the car, maybe even prior. What, he says this is his name, and, and I'm the one who Joanna shot. Um, at that point in time. Has no real, the shooting part of it, I guess, as an explanation for his kind of violent outburst as they're searching near the groin. Those two are wholly disconnected, unless I missed something in the video. I, I, and I think they're also, it's also inconsistent. I, I don't, anyway. Um, and I think it's harmless error. One of the question on the DVD, later on in the encounter, after he's been, uh, Tucker's been put in the police car, I think one of the officers says, this is the guy that Scarlett shot. Officer Scarlett, I think he's talking about. Was that redacted or that, that sentence from the officer? if I can briefly, thank you. Yes, I believe that was redacted in the version shown to the jury. Thank you. Do you mind picking up where he left off? That was where I, I my last question with you as well was um, about the full CD. And you said you were acknowledging it wasn't raised as a full constitutional issue, but can you um, tell me your position on as far as discre uh, abuse of discretion? Yes, Your Honor. The bar for relevance is incredibly low and Mr. Tucker was faced with a prosecution, I believe it's apparent from the transcript, where he thought he was targeted for unfair reasons. Uh, it was a part of the state's case that his violent reaction to law enforcement was part of their evidence. It was in their opening statement. It was in their closing argument. And Mr. Tucker thought it was very important for the jury to understand uh, what the source of his reaction was and why he was acting that way. And more importantly, he wanted the jury to see all of the evidence. He felt it's clear from his testimony that the state was picking and choosing what to show the jury and not showing them the full picture. Which I think he did. He's, he's got quite a hurdle because he's trying to offer statements by himself, correct? Correct, Your Honor. And um, there's, the record does not really develop whether there are any exceptions that may have applied. Uh, it would be Monday morning quarterbacking of me to go through line by line to his statements and try to pick out exceptions. There might be some, there might not. He did face quite a hurdle there. However, uh, the, the basis for his objection um, and his argument before the district court was a rule of completeness, that the state was showing part of the picture and not the complete picture, and that fairness under the rule of completeness, as is discussed in the Huser case, required that the jury see the full picture to completely understand what happened. Right. Not be used to get it in for his, get in hearsay. Absolutely, Your Honor, and that's where the record might be lacking in this matter. Returning briefly to the issue of the settlement documents, Mr. Slovens come up with a number of ways that the states was pr allegedly prejudiced by the late production of this evidence, but I think it's important to look at what the state put in the record. The state's argument here was limited to delay. It didn't talk about its inability to find how much the vehicle was worth or anything like that. Uh, it was worried about its delay in be able to, being able to authenticate this document. And I think this is important because of what the state's duty is in a criminal case. A state's job is not to win trials. It's to ensure justice, it's to find the truth, and it's to ensure that the defendant gets a fair try, trial. Now, Mr. Tucker may have been in the way of getting a fair trial himself at this point by not disclosing this document earlier. It should have been disclosed earlier. I, other than the explanation that's in the record, I don't have any excuses for Mr. Tucker. But with the delay that it takes to confirm this document further the state's duty in ensuring a fair trial and justice, or would it just hinder its ability to win its case? I think that's an important question when you're considering the factors under Veal. So under what 
What circumstances would the district court be within its discretion to exclude relevant evidence in these kinds of circumstances? When the prejudice cannot be cured, when there is, ev when there is no evidence that the delay in disclosure was partially on someone other than the defendant, when the state actually demonstrates prejudice rather than just discussing the amount of time they might need to verify the document, uh, these are all factors that the court could consider. But on this record, the sole issue the state raised was their inability to verify the document and the timing of the disclosure. According to Judge Kelly's order that was recited in the Court of Appeals, it seems to me like um, Judge Kelly put several reasons in there why he said no. Violation of reciprocal discovery, that is a reason. Um, we're in the second day of trial. Uh, the state hasn't been given an opportunity to prepare. Nothing prohibits Mr. Tucker from testifying about it. Um, and then he mentioned authentication, identification, and preparation. But the bottom line was it appears to be an unfair surprise. Isn't that a several things, not just plain, I don't want to continue trial? Yes, Your Honor, there are several things, and I'm focusing on the thing that the state raised in its argument. Uh, I do understand that Judge Kelly identified multiple issues. However, under all of these considerations, the feasibility of curing the prejudice was something that did not get enough attention. I've got about 20 seconds left, so to wrap this thing up, I would just ask the court to Consider what would have happened if this was the reverse. If the state had suppressed evidence or not disclosed evidence pursuant to the discovery order until the second day of trial and then asked the defense to deal with it and to apply the test in veal in a fair and considerate manner to both sides. Thank you. And Mr. Slovin, the case of State versus Tucker is hereby submitted and we will adjourn for the morning. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.